black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. That's nice. <laughs> That's probably the best you're going to get from me as far as Christmas music goes. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Got a call from uh, Bob Gimlin this morning. He asked if he could come on and uh, give an update. There's a lot of things I want to talk to Bob tonight about. Um, most of you know the Ape Canyon story, uh, the famous cabin that was attacked back in the 20s up on Mount St. Helens. I've done two shows on it, and if you're a new listener... Um, I don't have the number of the shows, but I've done two shows on it. And what's fascinating is Bob and Roger Patterson actually went to that cabin and it was still standing. So I'm going to be asking Bob about that tonight. And I'm also going to ask him if he's ever seen anything weird out there in the woods. Uh, it's a question I've always wanted to ask him and his answer might surprise you as far as what he's seen beyond Patty. You know, we always talk about Patty. Um, and I, and I want to ask Bob too. I, I know it's a question he can't answer, but I wonder if he, he still feels like Patty's alive. Uh, so there's a lot of questions we'll get to tonight with Bob. He also wants to address, there was, to bring the audience up to speed, there was a 50 year anniversary of the Patterson Gimlin film. And it was this big deal. Bob was there. He was supposed to be the main speaker. He wasn't allowed to speak. A lot of things went bad. You know, they were talking about the contract between Bob and his manager, and just a lot of bad things happened, and, and it turned into a complete um, storm. And so um, Bob wanted to come on and clarify some of that and, and, and how what has actually happened since then. And I know most of my audience, most of my normal audience probably doesn't care, uh, but it's Bob Gimlin. You know, it's uh, <laughs> Bob's a friend. I'm going to have him on. Bob could come on and talk about tying his shoes for an hour, and I would allow it. Uh, so it should be a fun show. Uh, we'll get to some of the drama stuff, but I'll ask, ask, ask Bob about some of this other stuff, too, as well. And I know the audience always loves to hear from him. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you guys. I, I hope the holidays are going well for you. I hope... Um, you know, it's it's a rough time of year for some people, and it's a great time of year for other people. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen tonight. Um, I got you guys tonight. Uh, I'll be back on Friday and as well on Sunday. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. Bob, how are you? Hey, fine. Thank you, Wes. And it's good to be uh, be talking to you this morning. Yeah, it's good to be talking to you, too, as well. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you. Well, and likewise, Wes, back right back at you, my friend. Yeah, I'm going to be passed out with calorie overload here probably by tomorrow night. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's that time of year, I guess, where gluttony is well, okay. Man's got to do what a man's got to do to enjoy it. You know, that Thanksgiving is a pretty special day, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And I'm not, I know the fans are going to be happy to hear from you. Uh, on this holiday weekend. I always wanted to ask you, Bob, uh, and I know there's other things you want to get to, but I always wanted to ask you about Ape Canyon. And for the audience listening, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you've heard me talk about Ape Canyon. I've I've done audio on it, kind of retold the story. Um, but you were actually at the cabin before it burned down. What? How did? Can you tell us that story? And what did you think well, of the whole place? 
Yes, I can, Wes. Uh, you know, Roger had talked to one of the guys uh, in the nursing home that was there. And uh, uh, so him and uh, one of the, his descendants knew Roger. So they went to the nursing home and talked to him about it. And that's where the story all came from, is when Roger went and talked to uh, him at the nursing home. And so he was one of the, uh, the remaining uh, men that was there at the cabin when the when the Sasquatch tried to tear it down and get to him because they had the story went as as you remember that one was shot there and then fell off in the canyon and then that night uh, uh, but anyway so Roger said let's ride in there Bob and we'll go take a look at that Ape Canyon area and up where the cabin was. So we rode in there one day, and it was a pretty good ride in. The cabin was well worn, and you know, I mean, it, it, you could tell that it had some H on it. And this must have been in 1960 or 61. I don't remember the exact year, but it was right in that time. And I only went in there one time, and of course, I never tried to go inside the cabin. Because it was pretty, pretty bad shape, you know, everything was, it, it was still upright, but the roof was kind of bad, almost caving in, and uh, it was made out of heavy logs. And so uh, the logs were still in place, the roof was caving in, and I didn't try to go in, I, the door was kind of just hanging there, but I wanted to look off in Ape Canyon, and I and uh, I also wanted to see if we could identify the tree that they talked about that they shot, uh, and, and of course we couldn't identify the tree. But it was really, uh, really good for the, that I could go there to Ape Canyon and then look off over in the canyon and see what a great drop it would be if one was shot and fell off into the canyon. And how far of a drop off is it? It's pretty far down in there into the, the canyon, isn't yeah. it? Oh, yeah, I'd say probably at least 100 feet, maybe 200 feet down to the bottom of the canyon uh, at that particular spot where the, the Sasquatch was supposed to have went over the side and down in. So if that's true, even if it was just injured, it probably would, even though, you know, Sasquatch have incredible abilities, uh, it still would have probably killed something to fall that far and hit the rocks below. And what was your feeling at seeing the cabin? Because you guys hadn't filmed Patty yet for another six, seven years. Uh, and absolutely. I, and I know you were kind of um, skeptical. What was your feelings being there and knowing the story? Well, Wes, uh, knowing the story, uh, uh, I just, I was kind of, uh, you know, kind of mesmerized or whatever you want to call it to be up there at the same scene of the place and approximately as close as the description was that we were right close to where the Sasquatch was shot and went over the cliff. And of course, I, I want to, and I'm not afraid of heights or anything. So I looked down in there a lot and thought, Oh, that's, that would be an awful fall for anything or anybody. And then you know, yeah, I was kind of a skeptic, but I thought, well, if that really did happen, you know, and then those guys uh, rocking the cabin and throwing stones and logs and stuff in there, then uh, those guys kind of had it coming in a way. But, you know, I'm kind of a guy that says a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye. So I figured if a guy was going to shoot one of them, even if he didn't understand what they were, uh, if they were scared and he shot it, then it would have been nothing but right for the Sasquatch to invade the, the cabin and, and spook them or scare them or try to harm them. So, you know, my thought was, well, justice must have been served. But yet I had an awful funny feeling in my stomach that, that you know, I'm here where history was made with the Sasquatch. And I don't really understand the Sasquatch, but if, if they are the human type uh, creature that uh, that Roger and the guy everybody had talked about, then we had a long ways to go to learn how to 
get along with them better. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I think it's fascinating you were there. I would have loved to have seen the cabin. I know uh, Mark uh, Marcel was going to take me up to the location of where the cabin was at. We had to turn around because the weather got so bad. Uh, there was snow, The snowstorm was coming in. Actually, an ice storm was coming in. And I'm glad we turned around because if we wouldn't have, we would have been in big trouble. You know the area, Bob. It's rugged. Oh, it's about as very, rugged as it comes. Yes, it's rugged. So even riding the horses in there was not an easy job to get in there, you know. And so those miners, uh, I don't know, I don't recall whether they were supposed to have pack mules or what, but they had to be pretty sturdy guys to even pack in there and then build that cabin that sturdy. It wasn't very big. I can't remember. I never measured it or anything, but it wasn't a very big cabin. Yeah, it sounds like when you read the record, it's it's actually just a small shack, but it was well put together. I mean, the guys described that really well, how well it was put together, which is true. I mean, if you saw it in the 60s and it was still standing, even though it was falling down, uh, that's kind of a testament, testament to a homemade cabin. You know what I mean? Well, the logs, Wes, the logs, the, the frame of the cabin, the outside perimeter was really heavy duty logs and they were placed in there pretty doggone good. You know, uh, I've always thought about building a log house and stuff, but I thought these guys really knew how to fit the joints together at the ends, the way they chipped them and sawed them and, and, uh, and to get that kind of equipment in there. So I kind of marvel the fact that that cabin even held up under what uh, things that they say happen, you know, with the rocks and the, uh, the rocks and the timbers and stuff that was thrown at it. But these logs were big. They were big, heavy-duty logs. And I think that's one of the reasons why it wasn't a very big cabin is because uh, to lift those in place, I guess, you know, those guys were young and strong, so they must have used some kind of levers or something to get them up there because the walls weren't very high either. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that. How tall was that cabin? Do you remember? Well, it, well uh, the best of my memory – the cabin, the outside walls were just a little over six feet. So, see, it wasn't a very high cabin, but the roof had a good slope to it. So the peak of the roof, you know, I, I'd guess that that would get about 10 feet or so uh, because this, the cabin itself wasn't very wide either. And so it, whatever slope it had, it had a good slope to what was left of the roof. Yeah, I appreciate sharing that. I've always been curious if anyone has actually seen the cabin, and that's awesome that you were there. Because you don't hear, I mean, I know Mark found the place of where the cabin was at, but there's not a whole lot left there. And I know he's searching for, you know, empty shell casings and um, tools and that sort of thing. I know they had a mine that was nearby. Um, I'm not sure where the mine was at, but um, that's fascinating that you were there. Well, Wes, I, if you don't mind, I'll talk a little bit about that mine. Yeah, please. Uh, he made Roger and his nephew or the, his relatives a map of where the mine was. But the mine was down over the edge uh, of the cliff, and then you had to swing into it. It was down about nine, ten feet over the edge, and uh, it was supposed to be lined up with a lake. Uh, you'd line up Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams and then this little lake. Well, the place that we thought that they had for lake was a swampy area that had dried up. And so I tried to do that over the side, uh, repel over the side. And I just, I was able to get down there a ways, but I couldn't swing in. I could see the hole, the place in the side of the mountain there where they did it. And so uh, I wasn't able to go inside where the mine actually started, uh, but I could see the hole in the side of the cliff or in the side of the mountain there. And uh, basically, that was one of the main reasons that Roger wanted to go up there, because uh, the guy that gave him the map and stuff said there's lots of gold in there, and we just left it behind when, when the Sasquatch got heavy after us by uh, uh, bombarding the cabin. And so they didn't even go back and get the tools out of the mine or anything is what I understand, what he told Roger. So Roger uh, tells me all of what he talked about when the old man told him. And so uh, uh, Roger wanted to get, get in there. And, of course, Roger was 
not able, not physically able as well as I was at that time because I was pretty young then, see. I was in my uh, early 30s and so and in great physical shape. So I was going to try to get down into that and and take a look and see if there was uh, gold in there. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, well, the gold is nice. I'd love to see the tools, too. Um, and it really makes you think something happened to those guys, whether you buy into that encounter story or not. Something happened to those guys because they left everything and did not return and they left. And if you up and leave like that, you know something happened to those guys. And they've never veered from their story. I mean, even some of the other guys, I know, um, what's the main guy that came out and talked about it? Fred Beck. Uh, Fred even Beck. some of the other people that were there talked about it. And it matches up exactly what Fred Beck says happened. And you hear family members, they recount the same thing. So, yeah, it would be awesome to find that mine and actually see if they left their tools behind. I bet you they did. Uh, because, you know, if something like that happens, you're going to pack up and just go. <laughs> you're not going to stick around for tools or gold. Well, that's, that's, Wes, that seemed to be the story right there. Those guys were, uh, they wanted to get out of there with their life, you know. And the gold and the tools wasn't worth uh, taking a chance on losing their life. Because, you know, if these things were that serious, uh, these mountain people were that serious, they were lucky to get out of there, in my opinion. I couldn't agree more. They were lucky to get out with their lives. It, with the way those creatures came in, the way they describe it, they're lucky to walk away with their life. And I think it was more than just intimidation. I think those creatures wanted one of those guys to rip them apart. And there was too many of them. They were in that shelter, and it was it became apparent it was more of a problem than it was worth. So it, I think the creatures backed off. Um, well, I think that's true, Wes, and and I strongly believe now the that I know more about the Sasquatch that they were after that one single guy that did the shooting. They knew who did the shooting, and uh, I think if they could have got him, uh, they'd have did what needed to be done with him, and the other two guys would have been okay. But you know, the uh, partners don't want to give up one of their men. Because you don't, they don't really know which one uh, is they're going to pick out, and and that, that's just a shot that I'm guessing about. You know, I have no way of knowing what they had in mind, or nobody else does. But it's a it's a fact that if uh, if uh, the guy that did the shooting uh, that supposedly killed that one or or shot it, wounded it, where it went over the side, I the Bigfoot knew who he was. Uh, but anyway, I won't go on that anymore because, you know, we've learned so much, Wes, in 50 years since Roger and I got that film footage about them. But we still we're still just we're just beginning yet, in my opinion. But we're we're going forward quite rapidly and uh, know now that uh, that we need to figure out a way to protect them and let have people understand that they're just forced people and they've got a reason to be here they were put here for a reason and we were here we're here for a reason so uh, native americans uh, they lived among them without any problems and so when we can learn to do that then i think we'll 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 get a long ways with them that's just my personal opinion yeah. Wes. no and i respect that very much i think they the sasquatches on mount st helens actually i want to ask you a question about patty but the sasquatches on mount st helens are notorious for violence and in this particular area where you guys were at bob if you talk to the local natives in that area they will not step foot on mount st helens and they you're will, right and yeah. they are terrified of these things but you're right there is a lot of cases where native americans seem for whatever reason, seem to get along with these things, and there's really no altercations uh, for the most part. So, I mean, it, it's hard. We are have gotten farther, and we have learned more, and I like to credit it to witnesses coming forward and sharing descriptions, sharing behavior, sharing what they experienced. And I think you learned so much from that. I mean, just from me, when I had you on, Bob, on the show a long time ago, and you were talking about, you know, what happened before and after the, the video. And actually, what happened during that time? You learned so much from from eyewitnesses. Um, I wanted to ask you: Do you think Patty's still alive? Well, uh, I've been told by uh, sources that seem to have an awful lot of input with them, and uh, uh, 
uh, they say that Patty is very old, but she's still alive. So, you know, I'm not going to argue that point or say I don't believe it or do believe it. It's just that the person that told me that seems to have an awful lot of uh, connections with the Sasquatch. Yeah, that's interesting. I hope I hope she's still alive. Um, I would love to know how long they live. I would love to know. There's so many unanswered questions, but you're right, Bob. We are getting closer and closer and closer to uh, learning more about these things. Um, how's everything going after the, the 50th? I know when I talked to you a couple of weeks ago, you were pretty mad. How are things going now with you? Well, Wes, I kind of would like to uh, uh, I'll just talk about it a little bit more, and then after that, uh, I just, uh, Russ and I got some other things that we need to put my, our energy into. And, uh, I, I'm just, I was so upset when it did happen, Wes, you know, I didn't eat or sleep for four or five days even after that because I couldn't understand why. And, uh, then the only thing that I could come up with was, uh, uh, somebody, uh, a particular person, brought that 80-20 thing up, which never was, uh, it was, uh, that was what I think the whole thing was about. I think they started out thinking that Russ was taking advantage of me, which all they'd have had to done is come and talk to me and talk to Russ and known that that was not true. And uh, instead of, they decided to start a, a deal, save Bob. Well, uh, they never even, yeah, free, they never realized free, Bob. free, uh, what's free, free Bob. Yeah. Free, free Bob. Bob. Yeah. And see, I didn't even know when I first heard that, what in the devil they were talking about. And, you know, and so if, if the way I look at it, if a man's got a question about something, if he's got any kind of man about him at all, he'll come and talk to another man about it. And, and what really hurt me the worst, Wes, was uh, people that I'd had really good relationship with for quite a few years and enjoyed them and, and just considered them like part of my family. And then to find out that they turned against me behind my back and did that free Bob thing without coming and talking to me about it. Uh, they were going, I, I think maybe uh, the particular guy like Tom Yamron thought he was doing me a favor. Well, if he was a real good friend, like we supposedly were in the past, he would have come and said, Bob, what is this 2080 thing? And I just said, hey, I started out with that. Russ didn't even start it. I was the one that started the 2080, and can, then can, Russ wouldn't sign you, it. Can you explain that, Bob? I, I don't think people know what you mean when you say 80-20. I didn't mean to okay. cut you off. I apologize. Yeah, I'll do that, Wes. Thank you for allowing me to do that. What it was was uh, Russell and I wanted to do some things like the video and some pictures and stuff, and he was uh, he was paying for everything. So I said, well, Russ, let's just draw up a contract that uh, the sales from that after we pay for the expenses, I'd get 20 percent and you get 80 percent because you're paying for everything. And 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 I was the one that drew that up. And then we had a copy of it. Well, Russ wouldn't sign it, and I didn't sign it. So we just aborted the whole dadgum thing and made a whole new deal, which was so much better for me than, than I had made the deal with Russ. And Russ was not going to sign the, the 2080 agreement, and I didn't sign it. So there never was a 2080 agreement. And uh, some guy looked at that at my place and passed that word on down the line to Tom Yammeron or whoever else it was that they passed it on to. And my wife actually told the man uh, when he told my wife, he said, well, we're going to get Bob in a room and talk to him about how Russ has taken advantage of him. And my wife said, don't do that. Uh that's going to make Bob really, really mad because there is no such thing as a 2080 and said, Bob's a nice guy until you get him mad. And then he's pretty ugly when he gets mad. Well, uh, then I was down there and some lady that I know real well, a good friend of mine and Tom Yamarons. And, uh, she come up and she said, Bob, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, what's wrong? And she said, this save Bob thing is bothering me. And I said, well, what are you talking about? 
I didn't know what it was all about. And and she started bawling and she left. She said, I can't talk about it no more. It's just it's bothered me too much. So I, I still was in the question of what went on because I had that Friday when I got down there, I talked to Tom Yamron as just my old buddy, same as before. And he never mentioned a thing about it. And so it was it caught me uh, off guard, caught me totally off guard, Wes. And when I then when I did get mad, I was I was I wasn't doing good things. I was embarrassed about it afterwards because I didn't want anybody to see me display anger. But I did. And I couldn't help it because. Wes, I don't I don't know if you will agree with me or not, but when a friend does you something like that, it's worse than anybody else in the world doing it. Somebody else, a stranger, could have done that to me, and mm-hmm. I would have just got upset. But when you have a guy that is close, as many things as Tom Yamaron and I did together, and he did nice things for me, and I, and he went with me all over and, and was able to uh, – to, when I'd be invited, was able to go with me in the same way with Mark. You know, Mark did some nice things for me, too. And when they wouldn't allow me to speak, if they only knew what I was going to get up and say, after it all happened, I was going to get up and and honor them for putting on the conference and, and, and say, hey, I did some great things with these two guys before. And why are they doing me the way they're doing me? And uh, – and and then the stories that came out that were untrue, that's that's what really bothered me, Wes. When the stories that come out that rest hustled me away right quick, right after Dr. Melgram got through speaking, that is so much a lie. I sat there and, and when they started the auction, I'm wondering if there's going to even mention me speaking. And so it didn't happen. So I went over by and talked to Dr. Jeff Melgram for a few minutes, you know, uh, uh, you know, said, well, Jeff, I really like your presentation. Then I went to the bathroom and I come back out and there was other people standing there. And when I got mad at Tom uh, or got upset at Tom and went and confronted him and then he denied it. And then that really made me mad. And then uh, uh, John Kirk come up and said, come on, Bob. And he put his hands on my shoulders and I said, get your hands off my shoulder. Uh, and because Tom Yamron, I had on a sweatshirt uh, that R- Russ had given me because it was kind of cool. And Tom Yamron said, why have you got that shirt on? I said, I can wear any goddamn kind of shirt I want to anytime I want to. And, and I don't need somebody to tell me what I need to be wearing. And so that's what got me. That really got me hotter. It made me just I was ready to start throwing punches, but I knew I couldn't and being thomas had that stroke that would have been the worst thing i could have ever done is what i felt like when tom denied that he put that on facebook lied to me with me standing right in front of him i thought well now why is this all going on this is so crazy i can't hardly believe it so then uh when i we got ready to leave they said well russell hustled me out Russell didn't even talk to me because uh, by then I was talking to Craig Woolheater and some other folks. And uh, John Kirk and his wife came up and apologized to me for John putting his hands on me. And and I said, that's OK. You know, I understand I was a little out of line and I was kind of embarrassed about getting mad and getting out of line. But then I stood out there and talked to them guys for a good 10, 15 minutes and Brandon come by with my T-shirts and said, Bob, where do you want these T-shirts? I said, well, I want them to put them in Russ's pickup. So I took the T-shirts over and put them in Russ's pickup. He was busy talking to Abe, uh, Russ was. And so I just went and sat in the pickup and waited for Russ to get there. And so these people that talk about Russell rushing me to the truck and speeding out of there, they're just lying through their teeth, you know, and I don't understand what the object is of rate, doing all of that things, you know. And, of course, Mark DeWart, uh, he started the auction, and he was still auctioning uh, when we finally uh, left the scene, and that was 15, 20 minutes after Dr. Melman had got to speaking. 
he never even mentioned the fact that I was supposed to speak uh, when they started the auction. He just he just started the auction and kept on going. And I thought, well, I wonder why he isn't mentioned the fact that I'm supposed to speak. But he didn't didn't say a thing about it. So that that's what got us kind of upset with him. You know, and it just went from bad to worse and worse. And the lies that come out over this thing was not it wasn't uh, it was unreal. Well, these people that just keep on lying about it and lying about it. And I don't understand why they keep on talking, telling lies about it, you know. And so Russ and I have a great relationship. I enjoy being with his family. His wife and daughter are special really special people and Russell's been really kind to me and special. I think a lot of Russ, uh, Russ has never did anything, uh, to take anything away from me. He's just been the opposite. You know, he's did everything to help me. And plus a good friend on top of that, Wes, just as I consider you one of my best friends. I appreciate that, Bob. And you know, I think the world of you. I, I know what you mean. I went through that with my, with an old co-host and it hurts when it's a close friend. And, and you see that a lot in the Bigfoot world, don't you, Bob? I mean, a lot of people are nice people. They really are, but there's a lot of small men in this field. I mean, if you have a problem, I'm like you. If I have a problem with you, I'm going to come walk up and we're going to, We're going to hash it out face to face. I'm not going to go post a blog. I'm not going to go post on Facebook. I'm going to come up to your face and you and I are going to have a conversation. And that's what that's what men do. You know, absolutely. You know, and the the whole excuse me, Wes. No, no, go ahead, Wes. I'm sorry. No, you're okay, but you got me on a roll now. No, it's just nonsense that it's just complete. It reminds me of stuff you would see in middle school. And that's how the Bigfoot world is. It's like middle and my audience has no clue because most of them aren't in the Bigfoot world, but it's almost impossible to make a lot of really true friends. You might have a few here and there, uh, but I know like uh, when I was going through it, Bob, you were the first guy that called me and you and you said, hey, if you want me on the show, I'm here for you. And that well, always meant the world to me. It always, you know, at the time I was being kicked around, I was being drugged through the mud and you called me up and said, hey, Wes, if you need me, I'm here. And that's why, I mean, anytime you want to come on, Bob, you know you're always welcome. I'll drop what I'm doing to have you on. But it, it, it does hurt. I mean, people that you think are friends, and I've had it more than just one time in the Bigfoot world. I've had it multiple times where you think someone's your friend, and it turns out they'll stab you in the back, and then it's really for no reason. No reason other than jealousy and just trying to build up themselves and a lot of small men, like I said, just a lot of small men in this community. It amazes me. Well, Wes, I'm sorry, my friend, that that happened to you, but it sure does hurt, don't it? And it's like a bunch of little kids playing in the sandbox, you know, Uh, don't throw sand on me or I'll throw sand back on you. It's crazy. It's just absolute crazy. And the man, the man that I trusted and believed in is my true friends slammed me that hard. And I, I, it was, it took me days and I'm not over it yet, but I, what I want to do now is move forward and let them go move forward too. you know, uh, let Mark have a great conference and I hope he has a great, great conference. And Tom, I guess is supposed to speak on there's what I've been told and and I just want Tom to go ahead and because uh, we got some nasty we got a nasty letter from his wife, uh, uh, you know about Tom's condition, and uh, I know strokes aren't any fun. I had a mild stroke about fifteen years ago, and it took me a month or so to get back, and I was lucky enough to come back good. And you know Tom had a a magnitude of you know I mean his stroke was was really more than I understood at the beginning. And so I feel sorry for Tom, but why he went against me like that, I'll never know because he didn't talk to me about it. And he still don't talk to me about it. So, you know, I don't know what's, I don't know what's wrong. I just, I just wish the best for them guys. Yeah. No, and I, and I appreciate that. How do you think, how would you resolve this, Bob? Let's say you could step outside of this problem and you're not involved and those other you have no knowledge of those other guys. How would you resolve it? Let's say you were Tom 
or you were Mark DeWorth, how would you resolve this and fix this if you could? Or can it well, be fixed? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Wes. Uh, uh, of course, I'm, I'm a, this old cowboy guy, and uh, the way I look at it is get together and say, what prompted you to do that? And if it was jealousy or if it was something that they thought Russ was doing, it, but they, they, if they had some kind of proof, but they can't have proof because it wasn't happening, you see. There was, Russ was not taking advantage of me. Russ became a real good friend, and I asked him to be my manager, and he accepted and said, well, Bob, I know you've been just easy on everybody and doing whatever everybody wants for a long time. I said, well, yeah, I, I like people, and and I and I enjoy making friends with all the folks that I meet at these great conferences. And Tom Yamron and I traveled together a lot. And I met Tom in 2003, and we became good friends. And uh, people would invite me to come to places. Well, I just asked Tom if he wanted to go with me. And he always did. And, you know, Tom was up on everything, and he'd get the passes of uh, flight you know, and everything. And Tom was really good. And we had a lot of fun together. And then I thought he was, uh, I claimed Tom just like he was my family. And uh, then this happens, and I think, why? So the only way I think to resolve it is for us to get back together and talk to each other and say, uh, I give Tom that opportunity. I called him when I got home. And he wasn't real receptive, but he wasn't nasty or anything. But I didn't ask him, Tom, why did you do that? I just thought, well, he would explain to me without having to ask him. And the same way with Mark DeWart. I thought Mark was real close because Mark came up and asked me to sign some things for him right down there after all that happened. And I gladly signed the stuff for Mark without any reservations at all you know and, and but that was before mark denied me a fact to say hello to the folks and there was people there that called me later and said we're really we're really mad bob because you were denied the fact to be up and say hello to us and talk a little bit about bings it was the 50th anniversary of the uh, patterson film gimlin film footage you weren't allowed to even talk about it all they did was do an auction instead. And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't have any answers for you. I just don't know why. I said, you know, it would have been nice. And if those two guys would have only known, I'd have got up and praised them, even though I'd already got after Tom. And I told him to go up and apologize to Russell and I. And he goes up there and he said, I apologize to Bob Gimlin and Russell Accord. He didn't even say why he was apologizing. So some of the people said to me, what was he apologizing for? And I said, oh, he didn't say, did he? And they said, no. And they were pretty mad. Some of the people that had come a long ways uh, from Nebraska and different states to come to that conference to talk to me and be there with me and hear what I had to say about uh, it was supposed to be to honor the 50 years of the film footage. And it turned out it was not an honor in the film footage. It was something else that that uh, Russell and Tom, I mean, that uh, Mark and Tom had in mind for themselves, I guess. That's the only thing I could get out of it. I don't really want to put them down. I just want to know what the heck was wrong, why they did what they did to me. I don't think I ever did anything wrong to those guys, except I got angry and got after Tom a little bit. Well, quite a little bit. And... Uh, you know, and it all started at the birthday party. I asked Tom if he's coming to the birthday party. He said, I wasn't invited. I said, well, yes, you're invited now by me. I want you there, you and Bobo Bo. And so then uh, I got there and Sandy, the gal that was putting on the birthday party, she had it way out into the woods in a little house. She said, uh, they stopped me from having it at the VFW club because they said it'd be a mess to clean up and they was going to have a conference the next day. And I said, who was they? And she said, the people is putting it on. And so I didn't ask her names. I just assumed that it was Mark and Tom, you know. I mean, what else are you going to assume? And on a Friday, Tom was real friendly to me and everything and uh, sang the Roger and Bob song and 
and it was it was really neat. And I never knew any of this was going on. And uh, and Tom didn't mention it to me and neither did Mark. And so when it all came to a head, I was astonished about it is I was so surprised I couldn't really believe it was happening. And then when I read when I seen on Facebook that Tom put it on Facebook, save Bob, I thought, what in the hell is going on with these people? You know, pardon me for swearing, no, you're West, right, Bob. but uh, but you know, I really was hurt, and I'm still hurt. And 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 you said how to resolve it. I just like to talk to these guys and have them call me and talk to me and tell me why they did that. And then I, if they haven't got it straight yet, I'll try to get them straight of what really the facts were, without jumping onto something that they don't know nothing about, and. They think I'm senile and old. Well, I am old, but I'm damn sure not senile. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And Russell and I have a real good relationship and probably always will. I love his family and uh, everything. And uh, you see, I, I don't understand why people would say things that they don't even know what they're talking about. That's what bothers me more. Well, I think when people do that, Bob, I think it says more about them than it does you. And I've, well, I've, I hope so. Yeah, and yeah. I, th- I think, and I really think that is, that's kind of how you have to look at it. It really says more about them than it does you. Um, and it's kind of a shame that it goes down like this. You know, the one thing I don't get is, let's say I was in Mark's position or I was in Tom's position. I would just call up and say, hey, Bob, I'm really sorry. You know, even if I didn't feel like I was wrong even though I felt like I had done nothing wrong, the fact that you're hurt and we're friends, I would just call you and say, hey, man, you know what? I'm sorry. It went down like that. I apologize to you. Uh, it should have never happened. I'm a, you know, and I'm sorry things went this way. And I'm just really sorry. I, ho- I hope, you know, put all the Bigfoot side stuff aside. There's no reason to post on Facebook. I would just call you up and say, hey, man, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry things went like they did. And, and I apologize to you. And I'd like to apologize to your wife and, and just be done with it and just be squash it right there. But that's, that's not the way it works in the Bigfoot world. No, <laughs> no, but Wes, no that. that's what I'd like to see happen. And fess up to the fact that my wife warned them about doing that and then why didn't they talk to me about it on friday when i got down there if they'd have just talked to me about it none of that would have happened but apparently they already had it into motion because they was recruiting people to save bob and what for you know they didn't even know what uh, the people that was recruited to to rally into that they had no idea what was going on, or I'm sure they didn't. If they, if they would have, they would surely come and talk to me about it. You know, now what I want to do is just go on with it. Go on, Wes, and let it be like it is. It's like I said, the old song. I forgive them, but I'm darn sure not going to forget. Yeah. I but agree. I just want us to go on and all of us work together as a team to go forward with the Sasquatch and learn more about them and realize that, that we need to know more about uh, the force people. Uh, uh, you know, we've, we just scratched the surface really in 50 years. And so if we can get with them and learn more about them, there's people into this that's, uh, that are doing quite well uh, and fairly close friends of mine. And uh, they're talking to me pretty much, uh, not daily, but uh, quite frequently about the good things that's happening. And they're trying to preach the good things. And I hope it gets through to more and more people. But fellowship is very important to me, Wes. You know, uh, like I consider you a very, very close friend. And uh, and I consider those guys a close friends. And I just like to get together with them and say, Hey, what made this all come around? Let's let's put it behind and go forward. Yeah, and the part that upsets me, like you said, Bob, how they're calling you senile, and um, I'm like that that cowboy might throw you a beating. You start talking like that online, you see him in person. You know, I know you're a sweet man, Bob, but you know, someone starts calling me names like that, and I run into them. We're going to have some serious problems, and that's how. But they'll never do it to your face. That just like what you experienced, they'll never do it to your face. So I go to the conferences, and everyone's nice, and all these researchers are, you know, everyone's very, very nice. 
And then I leave, and then they're writing stuff behind my back online. It's like, really? I was nice to you the whole time I was there. I never said. And so you get that. You get that mentality in this. And I, I don't know why it's like that, Bob. I, I don't. The, the Bigfoot world, I try and stay out of it. And I and I always make the claim I'm not a part of the Bigfoot world. I have nothing to do with it, nothing to do with any of those people. And I, I take that stance for what just happened to you. I don't want to go through that again. Um, yeah. And so I just back off of it because there's very few people that will come to you and say, I'm sorry. It takes a big man to come up and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And you got to be careful of your pride, especially in this field. You know, I've been very prideful in a lot of situations with this field. And it, it, for some reason, life comes around and humbles you and makes you realize you need to get off your high horse. And you're right. It does come down to just people want to hear Sasquatch stuff. They want to hear the facts. They want to hear people's encounter stories. They want to hear what you know. And all this other stuff is most people just put it off. I think people were an outrage because it's you, Bob. And I don't think these guys quite understand that because it's – and I said this in the last show you and I did. And I know you're you're going to give me a humble statement after I say this, but there's one guy you can't mess with in the Bigfoot world, and it's you. And I'm not have, I'm having you on the show because we're friends, not because of that. But this is the one guy you cannot mess with in the Bigfoot world. Otherwise, it's going to cause a complete shitstorm. People – they're going to come after you like a mob. And that's what those guys, I think, experienced after you came on the show. I think they went into mob mentality – People were really going after these guys on your behalf, and they come up with excuses. Excuses. Well, I, you know, I didn't run the, I didn't run the event, or oh, I didn't know Bob was supposed to speak. We just went into the auction. I was told just do the auction. Or you hear these excuses after excuses after excuses. Why not just come up and say, hey, man, I'm sorry. It went bad. I apologize to you, and I hope we can still be friends. All the nonsense in the Bigfoot world you know, Twitter, whatever. I hope you and I can still be friends. And that's what I'd like to see those guys do. Cause I, I think some of these guys are small men, but I don't, I wouldn't consider them bad men. Um, and I think if they put their pride aside, they could just call up and say, Hey, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry at the way things went. The other obstacle is your wife. <laughs> they, they think Bob is, is going to come after you. Bob's wife will come after you, man. That's the last person you want to come after you is Bob's wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Wes. Hey, Wes, well said, you know, I mean, what your statement just finished there was what sh should have happened. And I'd like to see it still happen because I've met so many wonderful people at these conferences over the years, people that I think an awful lot of from all over the different parts of the of, of the world, you know, different countries even. And for something like this to be so ugly, come down and then they're trying to make me out the bad guy, you know, uh, and I didn't have anything to do with this deal, except I was embarrassed by getting angry and displaying anger. Uh, I wished I'd have never done that. But when a friend does something to you and then won't admit it and, and face it, uh, Tom did say one time, kind of bluntly, well, Bob, I'm sorry. But he didn't say, I'm sorry for how it started and why it started. Uh, you know, I was still kind of the dumb guy on this side of the thing. And then we get a nasty letter from Tom's wife that said, if Tom ever gets well, it won't be because of Bob Gimlin. And that was, that was uncalled for because I love those people. Uh, his wife is such a special lady and his daughter and Tom always was. And I don't know. And then they keep saying, well, Tom had brain damage. Well, if he did, uh, I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, but if he had brain damage, then he sounded really good. I talked to Tom frequently right after his stroke and he sounded perfectly good, uh, made sense about things that we used to do. And so. All I'd like to see, Wes, is this what you got to stating, is to get it settled and pull together with the Sasquatch uh, uh, phenomena. And the, and the, we can't do anything if we're pulling separate ways. You know, there's just no way. You got to have a team on this. And uh, I want them to. Ha I want Mark to have a great conference. Lots of people attend. And if Tom's going to speak for him, I hope Tom puts on a great presentation where I'm sure he will. Uh, still, I love those guys. Are you still not attending the Ohio? 
oh no, I've got I've got some other things that I already took on in the same time. And see, gotcha. it's always been a little bit because I do a wagon train ride through the mountains that same weekend every year. Well, Mark also changed that time at one time for me. But see, I do that wagon. I've done it for 14 years now. We do a covered wagon ride through the mountains every every year for that week. And uh, so but I've I've already signed up to do quite a few different things that same week because I never Mark never talked to me and I never talked to Mark even before his conference. See, I wasn't able to make it last year. And Mark never mentioned it to me this year. So, uh, you know, so there was just a misunderstanding all the way around, it seems to me. And why they didn't come to me and man to man talk to me like men are supposed to do. And and just got what you got to say and Wes, what you said stands and and, and you put it well, you you did it well. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And like I said, Bob, I, I consider you a close friend too as well. And I just hate to see it like this, you know, and, and they don't understand, you, you know, it just needs to be fixed. This whole thing needs to be fixed, you know, and, it, and I assume I didn't know if it had been fixed or because you read online, everyone's like, yep, it's all fixed. Everything's done. Bob's happy. We're happy. Um, yeah, no, and that's it not, has, no, the, the, Wes, <laughs> it hasn't been resolved oh, at all. Nothing's changed. Really. No, excuse me, Wes, but it hasn't been resolved. And now then a lot of people are branding me the bad guy because I'm picking on the guy that had a stroke. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling the truth the way it was. And, uh, why other people are saying, okay, Bob, you're picking on a guy that had a stroke. I'm not, I care for those people. Why would I pick on them? I'm just telling the way it happened. And so I'm not lying about it or I'm not exaggerating or nothing. That's just the way it happened. And that's or that's the way I see it. Now, if they can prove it different, I'll accept it. Uh, I I just want us to go on and get this all behind us and go on as as human beings that care for each other. You know, fellowship is very important in this world. We have enough negative stuff going on anyway without it. And so uh, I just want this to go on and and, uh, we won't ever forget it. Uh, They won't and I won't. But I I forgive them for it. And uh, if they had just talked to me about it still yet and tell me why they did it instead of just leaving it in the dark and saying Russell's the cause of it. Russell had nothing to do with anything. Russell wasn't rushing me out, pushing me. And then they lie about things, saying Russell pushed me here and pushed me there. And we run to the pickup and left. It's all a bald-faced lie, you see. And why one people want to keep on lying is the thing I don't understand. Truth sure prevails. And uh, if people will just stop and realize that that is the very truth, the way it happened, and why we didn't get it solved right down there that day is beyond me, you know. Yeah, no, it is. And it's a shame it went down like that. And I hope it does get resolved. I, I hope I know everyone listens to the show in the Bigfoot world. I know they all heard the last one. And you yeah. saw all sorts of comments and people were making comments here and there. But, um, you know, Bob, I, I, I think what those guys need to understand is you're hurt. And you were hurt by the whole thing, and no one's come up and really said, "Hey, man, I'm sorry, I we messed up, and we apologize." You know, it was an important event. You know, it's it, I wanted to go to it so bad I couldn't break away, and it meant a lot to me to go to it. I mean, I I was thinking, "Wow, this means a lot. I'd love to go to the 50th anniversary." I mean, this is you know, and then to have it turn into that, I'm kind of glad I didn't bother going. Um, well, will, yeah. Will you be speaking at the um, international Bigfoot conference this year? Oh, yes. Yes, I will be. Uh, uh, I will be speaking there, and I, I'd like to see everybody there, and we won't even talk about what happened down there. Yeah. I promise I will not bring it back up uh, again. And, uh, you know, and I just want to get it resolved and go on with the stuff. We all need to work together, as we have been for the last 50 years, and get somewhere 
with what we need to do. You know, I'm getting a little age on me, and uh, but I'm not senile. But that's one of the reasons that I recruited Russell to take over my managing job because I, I'm I'm busy with a lot of other channels in life. You know, I do a lot with the youth up there with the harnessing and driving, and the wine tours. And, uh, you know, I've got a full schedule all the time. And so I'll be going to Nebraska in the spring to Harriet's deal and uh, hope to see a, a lot of. Is that a conference, Bob, in Nebraska? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, okay. it's a big, big conference in Nebraska that Harriet puts on. And then I'll be going to Kentucky later on shortly in about three weeks after that. And so I've got a full schedule. Uh, and it starts the 1st of May, goes right on through uh, to 2018. And as long as I stay healthy and, and you know, can do things that I do, uh, I'm still working the horses, riding the horses, teaching harnessing and driving to uh, students uh, that belong to the driving, harness and driving club. In a in a agriculture museum in a little town called Union Gap, just uh, nine miles from where I live, and so you see, my schedule doesn't have time for foolishness and a bunch of garbage. Uh, I'm a very busy person, but I love to meet people, and you know, I just I like to meet the people that come to these conferences. And I've been lucky enough to meet thousands of wonderful people. And that's what my, that's what my paycheck is, is to meet these people and visit with them and, and listen to their experiences and uh, just chat with them one-on-one -on -one and have fellowship with people. God, Wes, Wes, thank you so much. I mean, we don't have to be through yet, but you know something? You are a very special friend, and thank you so much for having me on uh, this morning. Yeah, Bob, I appreciate you coming on. Like I said, I mean, you're welcome on any time. And I don't want to keep you too much longer. I hope that those guys can resolve it uh, with you, and I hope it gets fixed. You know, the, the people in the Bigfoot world, they always cry all the time about how science doesn't take any of them seriously. And from an outsider looking in, I wouldn't trust most of them to make me a sandwich, let alone if I was a scientist to follow these guys. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, uh, Absolutely. you know, it's kind of, uh, 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 you know, I don't know. Uh, but I don't want to keep you, Bob. I know you got other no, things. No, no, Wes. Hey, Wes, I, I just uh, I just enjoy visiting with you, and I don't want to take all your time because, uh, you know, you and I have discussed things pretty good. But if there's anything else that you would feel free or would like to ask me, feel free to, Wes. Because yeah, there's, there's been one question that's bothered me a lot, and I wanted to ask you because I know you've spent so much time in the forest, and you've you've spent so much time out in the woods and spending this much time in the woods. Um, have you ever seen any of the lights, Bob, that people talk about the balls of light? I don't think I've ever uh, asked you that. Well, yes, Wes, I never talk much about that, but I've seen that blue energy light, uh, up in, uh, Okanagan country, uh, right on, uh, uh, the bank of, uh, the Creek, uh, Okanagan river and, uh, or not the Okanagan river, uh, uh, oh, yeah, it was the Okanagan River. But that's been quite a few years ago, and I didn't understand it then. And I talked to uh, uh, Dr. Dmitry uh, Bayanov from Russia about it, and Perkoloff, Dr. Perkoloff in Russia, and, uh, and, and a guy down in Pendleton, Oregon, by the name of uh, Roy Tim. And they sh assured me that that was some kind of orbs that uh, – that was trying to show me a sign that I didn't understand. So I never mentioned much about it, Wes, but I have seen that sort of thing in the past. And then I might just add this to it, Wes, uh, people that have these uh, dreams of different kinds. A few years back, uh, a lot of times I was up in the air. I don't know what I was doing. It wasn't me and Clark Kent Superman, but I'd be seeing places in the forest that that eventually I would go to and I'd know I'd been there before by just traveling over the top and looking down at them and then I'd be there and that was up in the Cascades and, and the Goat Rock area and all through the state of Washington through the Cascades even up on the Olympic Peninsula so there's some kind of connection that I strongly believe that I do have 
with the Sasquatch people. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating, especially when people see those lights. Was it just a blue light flying around? No, so- no, it wasn't flying around. It was solid, staying solid. And I walked up to it, and I had a feeling, but it wasn't there anymore when I got up to it. But I had a, a feeling of some kind of a pull of energy uh, in my body and uh, kind of got the shakes a little bit. And then I walked away back where I was standing before I walked up to it to see if I could see it again, but it was no longer there. And it was a really a blue, blue, blue light. And it was probably uh, a foot in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger than that, because I was looking at it at first from about almost 100 yards away and when I first noticed it. But I talked to a guy uh, that was lived up in there, a cowboy friend of mine that cowboyed a lot. And he told me, he said, Bob, right where you saw that, he's seen Bigfoot wade across that river there at that low spot. Interesting. And I, I, yeah, he said, Bob, I've seen those back in the uh, 70s and 80s. I've A number of times I've seen the Bigfoot walk across it. And, Wes, this is the first time I've ever talked about that. So I'm sharing that with a very special friend. No, I appreciate it. And I, I saw one very similar. What did it make? Except for mine wasn't blue. Um, did it make any sound? Didn't make a sound at all. And yeah. no smell. There was no smell, no sound. Yeah, it's very odd to see it, isn't it? I've seen one. It wasn't blue. It was, uh, I guess, more of an amber color. But uh, they're very odd to see. It's it's a very strange, especially when you come across it. It's hard to. There's so many weird things in this world that oh, people yeah. run into, you know, it's hard to to make heads or tail of it. But I, I appreciate you sharing that, Bob, the, the light story. I've always wondered if you'd seen them, because a lot of people who spend a lot of time out in the woods, they'll generally run into them, you know, at one yeah. point or another. But Well, well I, you know, Wes, I spent most of my life in the woods when I had time off from work, and I was lucky enough to be there a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, I did a lot of things, but I really did in my early years. I never was looking for footprints or I didn't I didn't know about a uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch, you know. And so therefore, I probably was around them and uh, they were around me and I didn't even know about it. But I did. I was pretty good tracker in my early days. You know, I did a lot of tracking and I was taught to track real well for my father at a very young age, five, six years old. And so I I noticed a lot of things that other people would not notice in the woods. Yeah, and I can appreciate that. You know, I know you've spent a lot of time out there, and I really appreciate you uh, sharing that light story, Bob. Like I said, it's it's something a lot of people are seeing, and they're seeing it more and more. You know, on top of Sasquatch, now people are seeing this dogman creature, and they're just seeing. It'd be nice if someone could get some something really good on film, like the Patterson Gimlin film. Um, and I think in your guys' situation, like I said, you think you stumbled on it, and Patty didn't realize the the, you, the horseback, I think, threw the creature off, because she probably wasn't expecting humans to be rolling through there. She heard four, you know, she heard her four legs, I'm just assuming, um, and that's why you guys were able to stumble up on her, and I always wonder if more researchers don't use a, uh, get a horse, get a horse and go look for him. Well, Wes, I don't think there's that many uh, people that... Uh ride anymore the horse was in the country you know four wheelers and snowmobiles and stuff kind of took over because at one time i was in a search and rescue team through the sheriff's posse in yakima area in yakima county and we did a lot of horseback uh, uh research you know was res- search and rescue stuff well then it was taken over by snowmobilers and snow because they could cover more ground but they didn't. They moved too fast, and they didn't observe. So the sheriff that we have at the present time wants me to kind of work back with, uh, uh, back to the old system of going out horseback. Uh, you know, it takes a little more money to get there uh, with trailers and pickups and stuff uh, than I guess it does with uh, snowmobiles. And you got the younger people with the snowmobiles, and then uh, you know, I can only cover so many miles. You know, eight, ten hours in a saddle, and then I'm ready to take a, a get a sit down and have a big meal and take and go to sleep. See, so uh, I'm still in great health for 86 years old. Uh, You're in better but, health than most guys half your age, Bob. What are you talking about? 
Well, I, I, <laughs> you know, I'm grateful, Wes. I'm so grateful. I'm a blessed man to be that way, and uh, and I really do appreciate it because you know. Uh, there's still a few things that limit me now. Well, quite a few things, Wes. But, you know, uh, I'm just keep on going and I'm not going to give up. And then when I get old and I'm maybe set down a rocking chair, but I'm not ready for that for 25 more years. And so to be senile and old, I hope I don't appear to be that way. No, not at all. You don't, Thank Bob. You, I would tell you. <laughs> I would tell you to I, your face. Wes, I would want you to. <laughs> no. You want your friends to tell you. Absolutely. Exactly. And uh, if you ever get out to our area, if you got any time, give me a call and we'll go do something that will be lawful, but we'll have a lot of fun. <laughs> there you go. Well, I appreciate it, Bob, my friend. You, uh, I sure hope everything gets resolved and you can kind of put it past you. And, and I hope those guys apologize. Just come up and apologize and, and be done with it. Um, but I appreciate Like I said, Bob, you know how much I love you and how much I enjoy talking with you and hanging out with you at the conferences. And I can't wait to see you. Um, you know, and, and happy and wish your wife for me too. Happy Thanksgiving. I, I wish you guys the best. And, um, I hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you, Wes. Right back at you, my friend. And, uh, uh, we'll get together again soon. And if you ever get to a conference, I can sit down and visit with you and have a cup of coffee or whatever we need. You know, uh, guys, I'll tell you, I just appreciate you, Wes. And, uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate- Appreciate being there. Thank you for everything. And you and the missus and the family have a great Thanksgiving. And if I don't get back with you before Christmas, enjoy the holidays and just uh, have a great winter. And come spring, we'll, uh, the grass will grow and the flowers will bloom and the bees will come out. And we'll just enjoy the sunshine and have a great life. And I just hope the Bigfoot people get out there. And I, I'm sure that Mark and Tom will get back with me, you know. Uh, you get that special feeling during the holidays from now on, Thanksgiving going on, you know, and then Christmas, then New Year's. You just get that light feeling that you need to be, uh, have fellowship and praise and thank God that we're upright and alive and that we're free to do ever to talk like you and I have been talking this morning. And, uh, and the people can go out and search for Sasquatch without having to have uh, an application to go out in the woods or whatever. So thank you again, Wes, for everything, my friend. And uh, I love you guys. Love Tom and Mark, too. You know, I don't have no hostility to them. I just don't understand. Yeah. No, I understand. Well, thank you, Bob. Well, thank you, Wes. It's been a great morning. And there he goes. Thanks, Bob. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone.
you still need.